Hello, this is Ken Keener from Lindenwood University coming to you today from my home studio. And today we're going to talk about the basics of piano comping. The piano has a difficult role in the ensemble, whether it be a jazz band or a combo, because many times we have to write our own parts. Um, there are two basic elements in piano comping, one being harmonic, the other being uh, rhythmic. And we're going to focus first on the harmonic element. <clears throat> comping is basically uh, an abbreviation for the word accompany, and that's pretty much what we do at the piano. Uh, guitarists and vibes often do the same thing. We're accompanying the, the melody and the solos, so we have to provide harmonic information for the, the folks to play over. Um, so sometimes we're presented with, um, you know, let's say a blues, <clears throat> and we have, you know, maybe an F blues, our first chord says F7. Well, the first thing we have to do is figure out what's in the chord. Okay, and that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but you basically have to know what comprises what we call a dominant seventh chord. In this case, it's an F major triad <clears throat> with a flatted seven on top. Okay, and then we go to the next chord in the blues, which will be our four chord, a B flat seven. And then at that point, we go back to F7. Etc. So a lot of times when young players see uh, a blues progression in F, they'll want to play what we call root position chords, which is what I just played. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of that as I play a bass line along with it. Okay, technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> the voicings I played were not inaccurate. I did play F7, B flat 7, G minor 7, C7. I played everything that the, the tune called for. However, the order in which I put the notes in the chord didn't make it sound very jazzy. It sounds very vanilla. So what we need to do is we need to figure out what the important parts of the chords are. Okay, first of all, if you're playing in a, in a combo or a big band, you're going to be uh, provided the bass line already with the bass player. So you don't really need to worry about the bass note. So we need to concern ourselves with the, the most important notes of the chord besides the bass. And that would be the third, which determines major or minor quality of the chord, and the seventh, which determines whether a chord is major or has a major seven, a, a minor seven, or maybe even a diminished seven. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is do that same thing I just did, but I'm going to take the rest of the chord tones out in my right hand. I'm not going to play the root or the fifth. By the way, the fifth is the most expendable uh, member of any chord. Most often it, it doesn't have much of a role in determining the quality of the chord, major, minor, etc. Uh, so I'm just going to basically play thirds and sevenths in the right hand and a bass line in the left. And that actually sounds much better because I'm providing more information with less clutter. Thirds and sevenths are often referred to as guide tones. They literally guide the soloist through the chord progression. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing that I did there, when I played each of those chords, I played three on the bottom and seven on the top. Third and seventh, third and seventh, third and seventh. Now, 
the more intelligent way to do that is to use voice leading um, or to use inversions, I should say, in order to present better voice leading. So, for example, the third and the seventh for the F7 chord is A and E flat, three and seven. Now, the third and seventh for B flat is D and A flat. Well, if I flip those upside down and put the seventh on the bottom, then all I have to do is resolve down a half step. Okay. Same thing then when I go to my two chord, my G minor, to my five chord, C7, and back to my one. So I could play all of those chords. very little movement, okay? And I can also start, instead of playing the, the uh, third on the bottom of the first chord, I could start by playing it the seventh on the bottom. fancier turnaround. So <clears throat> those thirds and sevenths are really the minimal amount of notes that you need. In fact, uh, now I'm going to switch and I'm going to play those thirds and sevenths in the left hand while I play a simple melody in the right hand. Okay. Bag's Groove, <clears throat> great song by Milt Jackson. Um, and those thirds and sevenths will suffice. Okay, you might say to yourself, well, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at doing the thirds and sevenths. Now I want to move on to something else. I want to add something to that chord. Okay, <clears throat> so when we get to that situation, then we, we have to figure out what the next note up in the chord would be the best note to add. Okay, so we're going to go back to our first chord, the F7. And I'm actually going to use um, the, the uh, other inversion that I started with. And that's putting the third on the bottom and the seventh on the top. Okay, so now if we want to add another note to that chord to get a three note voicing, we want to add that note on the top. Because we want to keep the thirds and the sevenths in the bottom of the voicings because they create the strongest structures. Okay, it's so the way all music is written, arranged, um, uh, organized. Our ears just hear that. We have the roots on the bottom and the fundamental chord tones of three and seven and sometimes the fifths on the bottom of the chord and then all the other extension stuff like nines and thirteens and all of that come on the top. So we, we want to keep the third and the seventh on the bottom. So we don't want to add a note on the bottom of the chord. And we don't want to add a note in the middle of the chord. We want that note to be on the top. So in F we have our third and our seventh. What would be the next note in the sequence of the chords, usually stacked in thirds, that we could put on top? Well, the next one in sequence would be the ninth which happens to be the G. The ninth is also the same as the second of the, of the scale of that chord, or the second of the chord. And that voicing sounds like this. Okay? Now, that's what we call a three-note shell voicing. Um, probably the most versatile voicing structure that you're going to be able to use. I use three-note shells all the time in my playing, both in the right hand when I'm comping and playing a bass line, or in the left hand when I'm playing a melody or I'm soloing in a combo or a big band setting. So the three note shell is your best friend. And if you can get past the guide tones and add that third note, it really adds a lot of um, uh, 
intensity to the voicing, mostly because of the dissonances created by the interval. So for example, if I play that three note shell voicing and I take the middle note out, <clears throat> I'm left with a minor seventh interval, which has a certain level of dissonance. Okay, now when we go to the B flat seven chord, we now have the A flat on the bottom and we now have the D on top, which is the third. Now the next note up in the sequence would be the fifth, which sounds good. Okay. However, if we want to make that note sound or that chord sound even better, instead of using the fifth on a dominant chord, and this is mostly for dominant chords, we can replace that fifth with the 13th, which just happens to be the sixth. Okay? And it's a higher up extension. One, three, five, seven, nine, thirteen. The eleventh is usually left out in the dominant chord. So those chords now sound like this. And when we go to the B-flat chord, we can keep the G on top. So once again, we have economy of motion, which not only makes it sound better, but makes it easier to play. Now, that B-flat 7 voicing, which is technically now a 13, sounds really cool because if we take that middle note out, listen to what's left. Okay, we have a major 7th interval between that bottom and top note of that 3-note shell. That's why it sounds so cool, okay? So now I'm going to play three note shells starting in 379 position for the 12 bar blues. <clears throat> and I'm just going to play whole notes, no rhythms this time. So there are your three note shells. Now I'm going to switch, uh, go to a different inversion, but I'm going to play three note shells in the left hand and I'm going to go back and play that bag's groove melody again and improvise a chorus afterwards so that you can hear how good those shell voicings sound underneath those melodies and solo lines. So I added a couple of alterations there, which is the other thing that makes um, playing the three note shell voicings very easy in comparison to playing four and five note voicings, is that if you do want to alter something in the chord, <clears throat> whether it be like a, a flat nine or a sharp nine or a sharp five, flat 13, flat five, you can just do one alteration in the top of the chord it might be like raising the nine or lowering the nine, and that will take care of any and all of the alterations that are called for in the chord, okay? And the alteration will always be in the top voice, which makes the shell voicing so much easier. You're not having to search for, okay, what note do I move? It's always going to be the top note, okay? Because the third and the seventh remain the same. Okay, um, now I'm going to play uh, some 2-5-1s using these shell voicings, okay? <clears throat> now, a two, the 2-5-1 is sort of the crux of jazz music as we know it, all right? It's basically a minor 2 chord, 
followed by a dominant five chord, followed by a major one chord. So for example, D minor seven, G seven, C major seven. So that would be a two, five, one progression in the key of C major, okay? Now, I'm gonna use the shell voicings to build uh, good structures to play through that two, five, one. And I'm gonna start with the three, seven, nine. So that's for my D minor seven, I have F, C, E, okay? Now, when I go to the G7 chord, instead of having to jump up to 379, all I have to do for the G7 chord is change my middle voice, my C, to B. Move it a half step. Now I have 7313, which is the perfect voicing for the dominant. And then that middle voice remains, and the other voices resolve downward. And there's my 251 in the key of C. I hardly had to move at all. Okay, if I do the other inversion where I start with the seventh on the bottom, same thing. My bottom voice moves first and then the other two voices uh, resolve later moving to the C major seven. So the shell voicings, the three note shell voicings are very versatile. Um, they are as much information as you ever need to present in terms of comping, okay? You can get more complicated, but you can become a brilliant jazz piano comper by just knowing your shell voicings really well. In fact, just knowing the thirds and sevenths really well is enough, but those shell voicings will really give you that versatility when you need to add that extra color to the chord. Okay. <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about harmony up to this point. What about rhythm? Now you heard me play some different rhythms um, as I was comping, but I want to give you uh, some simple things to start out with, okay? The first basic rhythm I teach my students is to play a long dotted quarter note, and this is all in swing style, a long dotted quarter note followed by a short eighth note, which sounds like this. Do, dot, do, dot, do, dot, do, dot. If I apply that to the blues, this is what I get. Now, one of the reasons I really like that rhythm of the dotted quarter playing on the beat, on beat one and then playing on the and of two is that you can switch around the articulations of those hits but keep the notes in the same place, okay? So now instead of playing a long dotted quarter note and a short eighth note, I'm going to play a short note on beat one and a long note on the and of two. Okay, and that's kind of the um, a stock rhythm that's also used in what's known as the Charleston rhythm, which was an old dance back from the 20s. And that would be playing, you, uh, you could use that rhythm playing the same rhythm, but playing both notes short. Et cetera, okay? You could also play both notes long. Although I personally think that one is, is not quite as interesting because you don't have very much space. You're not, you're not utilizing um, a mixture of, of uh, tone and space to create 
interest. Okay. Um, another rhythm I like to do that creates a lot of space is to use long, short eighth notes, like one and, mm, mm, do, dot, mm, mm, do, dot. And that can even be moved around within the, the measure. I'll demonstrate. Once again, the long short combination is really effective for comping. Um, now I'm going to combine the, the first thing, the, the first rhythm with the rhythm I just played, and we'll get this rhythm do dot dot, one and and. And that rhythm works really well, <clears throat> then you can mix and match these rhythms however uh, you, you want to do so. Um, one thing to remember, when playing these rhythms, if you play a long note, you need to play that long note right up to the short note. Okay? Or in the case of the short eighth note, or sort of the connected eighth notes. Yeah, you don't want anything that sounds like this. So one, two, three, four. If I don't connect that, it doesn't swing. Okay? Do, dot, mm. do, dot, that's a swing rhythm. Dot, dot is not a swing rhythm. Very square, very uh, clunky. Okay? So your long notes in comping need to definitely be very long and your short notes need to be short but kind of fat. They do not, they're not clipped. They're not as short as some of the staccato uh, notes that you might play in a, in a classical setting, you know, in a Mozart sonata or something like that. So, all right. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of rhythm is the idea of uh, anticipation. Okay. Um, and this is a really tricky thing to get used to, but one of the things that I want you to remember is <clears throat> when you have a, a chord, um, let, let's say that you have a chord on the downbeat of the second measure of a tune. Like in the blues, you have an F7 followed by B flat 7 on beat 1. One thing that's important to remember is the and of 4 in the measure before the B flat 7 chord is closer to beat 1 of the B flat chord than the beat 4 of the F chord. So technically that last eighth note of that first measure belongs to the B flat chord. So if I choose to anticipate that B flat chord by playing on the and of 4, then I will play the B flat chord early even though the bar line hasn't technically arrived. So I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to start on the downbeat, and then I'm going to anticipate every single chord of the blues so you can hear how that anticipation actually makes harmonic sense. If you were to do it the other way around, it would sound like you were behind. Okay? Here we go. All on the end of four. And, two, three, four. And, two, three. Four. Or even if I do it short. case of a turnaround like that, I played all of the notes an eighth note early. Now, one of the reasons that this works really well is because we're mimicking what's happening in the drum set. <clears throat> okay, the ride pattern. It's hitting that last eighth note of either the end of two or the end of four. Okay, and that's a really, really great way 
of lining up your comping with what the drums uh, will be doing at that time. And a lot of times drummers will also comp on the ands of two and ands of four on the snare. One, two, two, three, four, bop, two, two, three, four, bop, two, two, three. And that will get you lined up um, with the drums. That's why that dotted quarter eighth rhythm that I talked about early on, that's why that's such a critical rhythm to know because that will often really sync up well with what the drummer is doing, okay? Um, but the most important thing to remember is that you want to connect your long notes to your short notes, and all of these notes in the swing style <clears throat> have to be on the triplet subdivision. Uh, triplet, 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 doodle la, 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 doodle la. So everywhere... Somewhere on those uh, those triplet subdivisions, that's where your chords will have to fall. If you're early or you're late, you'll kill the groove. Okay, so you really have to be thinking about that. It's harder at extreme tempos when you're going a really slow swing or you're going really fast swing, because the the where we put the notes have a tendency to be different at faster tempos. But that's a uh, that's a topic for another day. Um, one thing that I want to encourage you to be careful about is overcomping. Okay, and I'm going to give an example. And I'm, once again, I'm going to use the blues. Lots of chords there, not different chords, but lots of rhythms on the same chord. Okay, the problem with playing like that and comping that much is that you're forgetting about the fact that there are other instruments comping as well. Um, the drums uh, drummer is comping within the kit on the snare or the hi-hat or the toms, okay? And you may also have a guitar player that's playing chunk, chunk, chunk quarter notes, all right? The bass player is walking the bass line. There's a lot of information going on in the rhythm section. If you clutter everything up with all those rhythms, it becomes very difficult for the drummer to know where to play his left hand. It gives no opportunity for the bass player to do anything but play quarter notes, and the guitar player is, is hamstrung as well. Not to mention the fact that there's so much rhythmic information being sent to the soloist that they're not exactly sure how to play or what to play, and it inhibits them. Okay, less is more when it comes to comping. Okay, using good rhythms and leaving um, a, appropriate amounts of space really helps free things up for the rest of the rhythm section in the soloist. You don't want to hog all the uh, all the beats. You don't want to hog all the inside the interior of the measures because somebody else has to play too. Okay, a um, couple other little things <clears throat> to remember. Um, and this pertains to um, comping in a big band, okay? Um, much more difficult thing in some ways. Uh, first of all, a lot of times today, the big band charts, the newer arrangements, usually have written piano parts, which I think is really, really good because it gives you the opportunity to have some voicings to use if you are a little unsure how to figure out your own voicings, okay? However, remember this. Number one, these big band charts are a basic roadmap. Okay, you are not obligated to play everything that's on the page. All right? It is a basic roadmap. You, are, you can feel free to thin things out. Often, um, arrangers and composers will put an awful lot in the piano part. And sometimes it's more, honestly, it's more than needs to be there. Okay? So I always tend to think of the the big band uh, piano part as a roadmap. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is instead of starting at the beginning when you're learning a big band chart, go to the places where you're going to comp first. Like find the solo sections and figure out what your roles are going your role is going to be there. Okay? What 
A big mistake that young players often make is they get a big band chart and there's like a, let's say a four measure introduction with the full band. Well, they spend hours working all these chords out in this very complex moving chord progression only to realize later that they're doing nothing but doubling what the band is already playing. Those are places, honestly, where the piano could just lay out and nobody would miss you at all, okay? Where you get a chance to play your most important role is whenever there are sections where either you have a solo written, a little solo part or fills or things like that, or you are in charge of comping behind the solos. Those are the places you should always attack first. Learn those and then the shout sections and the intros and all that stuff where your role is basically doubling what the ensemble is already playing, those are things that you can learn later if time allows. And if they don't, you can lay out for a lot of that, okay? But get those chords down. Uh, anyway, I hope this was helpful today. I know we, we kept things pretty basic, but the main points to remember is that you don't want to play root position chords when you're comping. One, three, five, seven is not incorrect. It's just not a good voicing option, okay? Get those thirds and sevenths for all your chords learned first, and then when you feel like you're ready, put that third note on top of the chord as it exists, and that will give you your three-note shell voicing, okay? <clears throat> the most versatile voicing, you can spend the rest of your life being a masterful jazz pianist not knowing much more than that. Um, I would recommend a book uh, by uh, uh, Phil DeGregg called Jazz Piano, uh, Jazz Keyboard Harmony. I, it's a text I use a lot. It's published by uh, uh, Jamie Abersol, uh, jazzbooks.com. Terrific resource. Every conceivable voicing you would ever want to use presented very thoughtfully and very thoroughly is found in this book, and I would highly recommend that. Um, anyway, once again, I hope this was helpful. Um, and thank you for being a part of the Lindenwood Jazz Festival this year. Um, I would certainly like to encourage you to consider Lindenwood when you're thinking about your music future. Lots of music opportunities at Lindenwood, both the traditional in terms of, uh, you know, classical and jazz and, and uh, various ensembles and degree programs, education and, and, um, and performance, but also a, a very 20th century approach to some non-traditional approaches to careers in music uh, that I think you'll find very, very interesting. So I do hope you'll uh, uh, check out Lindenwood when thinking about your, your future college needs. Uh, once again, I really enjoyed doing this presentation and I hope it helps. And remember, learn those thirds and sevenths and you will be a great jazz pianist.